I will call up uh, James next, James Newman, who is a professor of media at Bath Spa University. Um, James's books include Playing with Video Games, Best Before, Video Games Super Session and Obsolescence, and A History of Video Games in 14 Consoles, Five Computers, Two Arcade Cabinets, and an Ocarina of Time, which he co authored with Lynn Simmons. Uh, Simons. Um, he has also uh, authored white papers on video game preservation. Um, He's a co-founder of the National Video Game Archive and the Game Sound Archive, um, and the director of the All Your Bass Video Game Music Festival. Uh, and I believe his current research focuses on video game spectatorship and early video game music and sounds. Um, although he's very preoccupied just at this minute with um, disinterring the HDMI cable. And he just switched that over there. Uh, over to you, James. Great, right, thank you. Don't worry, that's my wallpaper. <clears throat> right. Yeah, the we won't make it through. That's what I expect to see. Right. Well, thank you very much for uh, inviting me. Um, and I should say that I have done a presentation. And when I was looking at it this morning, I realized I've basically squeezed an entire game presentation course in 20 minutes so i'm going to try and speed run it um and get through as much as possible and hook me off when uh we've got a goal or something when you come out um uh, so yeah i'm james um i uh have been working at basketball university um currently in the creative computing department where i head up the games development course um and i've done a lot of work in the last sort of 15 years or so sort of around game history and game preservation which is uh I guess to some extent what I was going to talk about um, today, thinking about what game preservation is, uh, why we need it to some extent, uh, what it could be, um, uh, and what the scope of it, I guess, should or could be, and maybe where um, there are some opportunities and challenges, um, putting ideas into practice. Um, so I'll talk a little bit through that, uh, and then hopefully round up with a couple of examples of projects that um, have worked on um, over the years to give a kind of uh, to give a, a sense of how those principles might uh, uh, work in action. The reason there is a big fossilized PlayStation controller here is some of what I'm going to talk about, uh, Rob mentioned it, uh, comes from a, uh, a book I wrote uh, 10 years ago now um, uh, called Best Before, which was uh, a book about the kind of challenges, opportunities, approaches to game preservation in particular. So a lot of the kind of ideas started to kind of form here and have been sort of developed over the uh, over the years. Um, and just to give you sort of a bit of uh, a bit of context, then, so yeah, a long a long time ago now, um, worked with the what was then called the National Media Museum, part of the Science Museum Group, to found the National Video Game Archive, which is a kind of collection um, part of the National New Media Collection, dedicated to video games. Um, so working with the it's now the National Science and Media Museum. Um, to put collections and exhibitions um, together to start to think about not only what should be collected, how you preserve things, but particularly how you would uh, access materials and gallery spaces. That's what that exhibition was about. Um, the um, thinking about how you how you deal with games in uh, sort of gallery spaces, gallery spaces that aren't really conducive necessarily to sitting down and playing 150 hour games that have complex branching narratives with 10 different possible endings. So you often find you get lots of arcade games because arcade games have been designed to walk up to explain how to play they last for about two or three minutes so how could we deal with other kinds of games in those sort of spaces um, and this kind of led to working with some really really interesting organizations and folk uh, across the world so up in the top left hand uh, of the screen there you've got stanford university uh, so henry lowood and his uh, colleagues have a huge collection of games and you know really really leading in terms of uh, not just collecting and documentation, but also things like data forensics. Uh, you've got the Strong National Museum of Play uh, up in the top right hand corner here, vast collection of, of digital and non digital games as well. And the Museum of Play, really importantly, an idea I want to kind of return to in the third hour of my talk. Um, that's a joke. Um, the uh, Ritz Bacon University, based in Kyoto. Um, uh, We've been doing game preservation and collecting since the 80s, being based in Kyoto, had some really good connections with Nintendo, also headquarters uh, there as well. So a lot of this research, when I say we, I'm often referring to a kind of collection of uh, a group of people across the uh, you know, across the world, but particularly um, in this country, um, 
the National Video Game Arcade, which uh, was founded in 2015 in Nottingham um, and has subsequently relocated to Sheffield and changed its name to become the National Video Game Museum. Um, so a lot of the kind of particular projects we're going to be talking about uh, later on really sort of uh, are things, I guess, taking the thought experiments and the research and thinking about how those can turn into both collecting strategies, but also um, exhibits at the, uh, at the NVM. So I'm going to start off by asking a question. What do video games want? Attention. Attention, yeah. Depends who you ask. I've, I've asked this question of like, you know, developers and publishers in particular, and they would have to say, they want to be paid for. Mm -hmm. um, what, do they, what do they want? What are you going to do? So I think a reasonably uncontroversial answer to that might be that they want to be played. Again, I think that's, that's, if not unique, then certainly a defining feature of what a video game is. And lots of game developers have real fun with this as well. I don't know if you're familiar with the game Sonic the Hedgehog, but if you were to put down your controller, refuse to do anything, Sonic the Hedgehog, after a while, Sonic will break the fourth wall, stare back at you, impatiently tapping his foot as if to say, this is a video game, do something. So we won't do anything without a player. We could say that play is so important, so constitutive, so configurative, as people like Stuart Moorcroft have put it, that you know, without play and without player, Almost argue there is no, there is no game. So it become it's become almost the kind of watchword of game studies that uh, video games to be played to be understood, and that's sort of tipped over into thinking about that sort of inflected, I suppose, attitudes towards what game preservation might be. So maintaining long term playability, our ability to play games in the future, has become a key objective of game preservation. So how do we keep this material available, playable? Um, and we know that's an issue because, and, and I should have prefaced this, but thanks, I'm not a museum professional. Almost everyone in my family is, but I'm not. Um, but uh, I took came to this question of preservation because you know, like, many, like many people, uh, the object of my study was disappearing and is remarkably fragile and it disappears at an alarming rate. Um, this is a photograph actually we took when the, when the uh, Museum uh, Arcade was based in Nottingham. This was about two roads away from the uh, then CEO's um, house on recycling day, which obviously tells you that the museum needs slightly better donation uh, publicity. But this is a bunch of stuff that's just been discarded. Um, it's been superseded. It was no longer required. It was obsolete. It didn't work. It was... So these games slip through our fingers. And the history of games, in some senses, is, is a history of storage media fragile storage media with data rotting away on these difficult to maintain fragile, fragile uh, data carriers. So museums collect objects. There are some pristinely collected and photographed objects from uh, the uh, archive collection. And even object you know, based approaches become harder and harder when we live in a, a digitally dependent uh, world where we have born digital objects and we have requirements for activation servers or online gaming that requires you know, networks to be, uh, to be available. And we know that these services won't last forever. Companies will announce the shutdown of certain services, which might make modes of games impossible to access, might make all games impossible to access. Games that, maybe some games are only intended to last for a certain period of time, they will not be available. And without some kind of you know, collaboration with the owners and providers of those digital networks or resources, those games, we just don't have access to them. And there's lots of discussions at the moment within across the world about preservation exceptions to these sorts of things. But um, presently, uh, we're in a situation where if, for example, you have a PhD student who starts doing a project on Super Mario Maker and halfway through their PhD project, Nintendo announced that Super Mario Maker is going to be discontinued, you have an issue. So what you do is you very, in a very agile way start to think, well, that's fantastic, actually. What we've got here is we can document a game that has a playable and a kind of non-playable state. It's a period where you can play this game, you can share all your levels across the, uh, across the world, and there's a period where all you have then is the ability to, you know, to remember those things or to access all the blog posts and videos about them, but not actually access the games and the levels anymore. So what do you do? So I guess the... One strategy, probably the most dominant strategy at the moment, is using things like emulation. 
or virtualization, various different techniques to try and essentially, if the, if the problem is that uh, data carriers and the specific platforms that are required to, to play games, those things are fragile and disappear, try and make that go away by creating effectively a kind of universal platform. So a piece of software that will emulate the performance of another piece of hardware. So our Nintendo Entertainment System, Famicom from the 1980s, there's a finite number of those things in the world that are not going to be made anymore. Um, we can take the functionality of that device, turn it into a piece of software that can run on our general purpose computer. We can extract the data from the uh, fragile cartridge and all its chips and circuits. And we can run this uh, run this game on our, well, not so modern Mac there, but, um, and we can do loads and loads of work around uh, visual displays, which are obviously a key part of what a video game is. Um, so we have different shaped pixels. We have beautifully pin sharp displays on modern, uh, modern displays that get rid of all the chromatic aberrations and blurring and smearing and ghosting, which were absolutely part of the aesthetic of these games. So we can recreate those things too. We can squash the image. We can make it look dreadful, exactly as it was supposed to be. So it's the design with those visual technologies in mind. Obviously, we've got issues around hardware and feel and latency. I'm not going to come into those questions here. Obviously, there's a whole bunch of questions about legality, um, which again is the subject for a different talk. The thing I'm really interested in here, though, is emulation appears to solve our problem in one sense. So, if long term playability is our, is our goal, emulation gives us potentially the ability to play these games long after the devices themselves have crumbled to dust. So there's a couple of questions. One is okay, so which which platforms, which systems get emulated? This is a problem often referred to as a kind of epistemic threshold. Tom Appley and Yossi Parika have called it. So you need a kind of critical mass around devices in order for people to you know, find them sufficiently interesting, uh, find that critical mass of people who can source documentation, who can create emulators. So we'll get you know, certain emulators, certain systems will be emulated very effectively. Others will slip through our fingers. So there's a whole bunch of things here all of which have an extraordinarily important role to play in the history of games, including the FM Town's Car Marty, which is a game system designed for your car. And if that sounds dangerous, I imagine it probably was. And these aren't actually particularly obscure systems, but they do, and there are, you know, there are plenty of others, derivative systems, bootlegs, clones, all sorts of things that, that, that won't get the kind of attention that the PlayStation, the Xbox will, because it does have that critical mass of energy, effort, and crucially, documentation that already exists around it. So emulation has its limitations, but if long-term playability is our goal, it's a really, really, uh, possibly the uh, most kind of viable solution we have at the moment. But actually, the thing I really want to think about is that question. Is long-term playability really our goal? Is that the thing we really, really want to do? Or rather, is it the only thing we want to do? Now I'm going to demonstrate this, I think, hopefully, by thinking about a couple of games. Now, there's a news, I don't know if any of you are familiar with, there's a Zelda game called Tears of the Kingdom that's just kind of, and my daughter's currently doing her GCSEs, it's the game is sitting on a shelf somewhere at home, and it is the reward, so all the revision and the hard work. Um, so I haven't played it yet, but please do not spoil it for me. But that's not what I'm going to be talking about. Um, there's another game called Ocarina of Time. Um, which is, insofar as we can trust sites like Metacritic, the reason for, you know, to some extent really talking about it is it is a lauded game, critically acclaimed, claimed by developers. It's top of all those lists of 10, 100, a million games you should play. Um, it's been lauded since, you know, the late 90s when it was, when it was released. It's an epic adventure. I sound like so I'm like I'm working for Nintendo there. It's an epic adventure that takes place over space and time. You move between playing your ocarina, between uh, being a child, being an adult, things you do as a child have some consequence. When you're an adult, you plant a seed, it grows into a tree. Later on, which enables you to scale that wall that you couldn't get over before. So huge map, lots of different encounters, lots of side quests that you can go on. There's a kind of storyline that you can go up on myriad, myriad kind of detours along the way. Here's the ocarina that lets you, amongst other things, travel through time. Has anyone played this game? Just out of interest. Has anyone finished it? Can I ask you roughly how long you feel it might have taken you to finish it? So I've got another highly reliable source here, um, which is the 
wonderful website, howlongtobeat.com. Um, the fact that there are already different categories of timings for this game, you can play through the main story, you can go through all the extras, all those detours and trading quests and side quests, talking to all those characters and seeing all of their dialogue loops, making sure you've extracted everything the game possibly has, if you're a completionist. And, you know, anywhere between like 16 hours to 55 hours to complete this game. So there's obviously already a number of different things that completing a game might mean, which reminds us that a game is not just made, but it can really be transformed through play. I wonder if anyone's done this. So if you want to play the game really quickly, one of the things that becomes evident <coughs> with this game, like a number of games, this is a sequence from quite early on, um, is that the fastest way to move in Ocarina of Time is run backwards. Because like lots of 3D games, and I tell my students this all the time, although you can sit there and really, really carefully work out the difference in speed between walking and running and jumping and side jumping and, and running and jumping, if you forget to put a throttle on the amount of time or the speed that you can go backwards, the players will learn the game backwards and they will play the entire game sort of running into the, into the screen. And they will do things like deliberately take damage because if you can time things just right with frame frame perfect precision you can use a bomb that's supposed to be designed for like exploding balls to propel yourself backwards get the game locked into a loop where you can just get ejected through and uh, move across the uh, you know this huge open field far faster than running backwards could ever could ever take you so with that in mind given that you put this game into the hands of players who will then try and find every way to exploit it. And given that running backwards and just being ejected by a bomb, <laughs> just the tip of the iceberg of techniques that could be um, exploited here. This is where I turn into a uh, 1970s, 80s sort of game play host. I would like you now to guess, or if you don't know, if you know sorry. Um, how quickly could that game be completed? So if you were complete, if you were trying to complete every, see everything, collect every collectible, speak to every character, it might take you 50, 60 hours. If you were kind of racing through it and just following the main plot line, speaking to all the characters, engaging in all those battles, growing up, becoming a child again, becoming an adult again, it might take you about 15, 16 hours. Does anyone want to guess how quickly the current world record for completing that game is? 12 hours. 12 hours. Eight minutes. 12 hours, eight minutes. Reason without glitches. Oh, always with glitches with me. I will be like five minutes. Five minutes. Five minutes. That's incredibly quick. Okay. Sure. But not quick enough. It's um, three minutes, 50 seconds, and 950 milliseconds. So, in the hands of certain kinds of players playing in a very particular way, um, this game can be completely transformed. Now, what it means, what completion means in this particular context is actually quite um, sort of, I suppose, debated in a way, because um, actually what this really does is after performing a series of extraordinarily complex and in the outside world, almost inscrutable kind of button presses and combinations, you can basically execute arbitrary code just by picking things up and dropping them, doing all sorts. But it doesn't mean modifying the game in any way. This is the game that is provided to you, plug the cartridge in, pick up the controller. You're not actually uh, externally modifying anything, but you can completely transform the way the game behaves. You can open a door that's supposed to lead you somewhere and it will lead you somewhere else, or you will just drop out of bounds and move through the space in between the game to navigate your way through it, magically appearing at the credits scene. <laughs> so games can be utterly, utterly transformed by play. It's not just that play brings games to life, it can change them into different things. It's not just about playing them really, really quickly. It's also about making them do things that perhaps they were never intended to do as well. So here's Super Mario Brothers, second appearance of Super Mario Brothers within the first hour of the uh, symposium. Um, game from mid 1980s, again, just to, just to complete the, uh, the narrative. A game that can also be completed in five minutes if you were. Uh, if you employ all the kind of techniques that uh, so-called speedrunners have uh, have employed to just basically break the game wide open. There's also something else that's quite interesting about Super Mario Brothers. And that's this, world minus one. So the game is made up of eight worlds, each of which has four levels. Um, 
world one, world two, through to world eight. This is something called world minus one. So this is this is a game that's probably been studied and analyzed more than any other in terms of game design. The opening like 10 seconds of this game have been studied probably more than any other level ever within game design and game studies as a kind of tutorial that teaches you how to play the game without ever reading a single um, line of uh, text from a manual. And what you're seeing here, you might be thinking, hmm, that doesn't look like a very impressive level. Unremarkable in one sense. Um, you might also think this is a some sort of similar tell that we got to the end and we just got right back to the beginning again. So what on earth is happening here? Looks like a kind of continuation maybe of Cory Archangel's Clouds, but it's not. What this is, is a level, actually it was much debated for many, many years what this was, this kind of unremarkable level that has the curious name of minus one, the so-called minus world. So is it a kind of debug level in the release of the game by the developers? Was it something that they were just using to test out different kind of mechanics? Turns out it wasn't. It was actually a level that is essentially procedurally generated by players playing in a very particular way. There's a part of a level in Super Mario Brothers that has a hidden warp zone in it. The way you access it is really neat. You kind of jump up out of the frame of the game and you find yourself running along the score at the top and you drop into this little room here, this warp zone, and you can go to one of these sort of characteristic Super Mario Brothers pipes that will then transport you partway through the game. The game is sort of in 1985 predicting speedrunning to some extent. So rather than playing the entirety of the game, you can, if you dropped into this little warp zone here, the secret hidden room, you can then propel yourself already halfway through the game. If, however, you don't run on the top of the screen and drop down into this room and instead do this, because Super Mario Brothers World is made up of tiles, imagine you've made a game entirely out of Lego and you really try to press those individual bricks together, but you can just get your kind of finger in there and you can still prise them apart. If you can get Mario jammed in between two of those tiles, the program kind of panics and says, oh, Mario shouldn't be here and will eject Mario to the right, because the basic logic of the game is keep going right, keep going right, keep going right till you get to the end of the level. And you can drop into this same warp zone here, and you can drop down this pipe here, that previously, the way the game is designed, took us halfway through the game to World 4, but now will take us to the Minus World. The Minus World is a level that could just crash the game. What actually is happening here is, because we haven't moved, uh, haven't scrolled this kind of room into existence, the invisible object here that loads these types with the correct data to say, go to world four, go to world three, go to world two, that hasn't been loaded because we haven't scrolled it onto the screen. That part of the program hasn't executed yet. These pipes are just full, this pipe is just full of like garbage data. It's just data that happens to be in the registers. And it says, okay, cool, generate me a level, make it out of the graphics from this level, the color palette from that level, the music from that level, the enemies from that level. And it just happens to create a level. It could do that, but it doesn't. It just creates a procedurally generated level called the minus world because minus is actually tile 36. It's just a blank tile. So we end up with these incredible extensions of the game, a level that was ne had never designed, not left in there by Nintendo, not even known about by Nintendo, but only created through play. And games do this all the time. Games go wrong in really interesting interesting ways and sometimes that's amusing sometimes it completely transforms our idea of what a game might be as in the case of pac-man a game that is routinely by namco its developers but also players playing it throughout the 80s described as a game that carries on forever and ever and ever and ever you will only ever either walk away from it lose all your tries um yeah run out of 10 p's or quarters to put in the machine until of course players really, really play the game and realize if you get to level 256, the game just crashes. You can't go any further. This endless game now turns out to have a finite number of levels and a maximum score. And a whole bunch of different playing practices um, turn into a race to get to this level. The reason you can't get past this is the way the game, uh, the way the game works is the counter that counts up every time you eat a, a dot here, it increments to 240. Once it reaches 240, the game says, cool, we finished level. There are 240 dots here, so you just can't get any further. You're just stuck, stuck here now. So these are things that are revealed through play. They are created through play, but the game is transformed. So if can I have two more minutes? Is that okay? I might be okay. 
right, one and a half minutes. So the implications then, I would say, of this are, of course, play is important. I would say play is like, too important to only really be the outcome of preservation. So the approach to preservation is based around long-term playability will give me the ability at some point in the future to turn up to a museum on a monorail wearing a silver suit, having had my lunch in tablet form and play a game. And that's really cool. But it won't necessarily tell me about all the practices that transformed and created meaning out of that game, all the possible players. So I guess one thing was argued then is that play is not just the outcome, Playability isn't then the objective, but play is something we want to be preserving and documenting along the way. Um, and just to show you two, two then really, really quick ways in which that gets put into action. So I think called the Game Inspector was something which kind of played around with in the Nottingham iteration of the, um, of the arcade. Here's a very proud version, younger version of myself. And you've kind of seen this actually. So this is really creating a navigable space in this case, using that same level of Super Mario Brothers here. And populating it, this isn't the game, this is a, a, a navigable um, sort of interpretation tool that takes your play away, but lets you move around that level. And each of these kind of magnifying glasses here lets you, you know, click on a particular point in the level that will show some of the video, like the video we saw, or tell you something about the, you know, the design of the level in that place or a particular technique that can be used. So this might sound counterintuitive, right? You take the play out of video games and sort of, you know, freeze it as video. But it suddenly opens up a whole different language and grammar of video editing. So you can start zooming in, you can pause, you can rewind, you can inspect, to use the say on brand, you can inspect the game in ways that you just can't when you're actually playing it. And you can start to account for the different ways in which it's played, different ways in which it's configured. That's one kind of idea was to take, start to create a kind of a collection of all those possible players and annotate, in this case, the the space. And the final thing I will just wrap up with was another project much more recently centering on a game called Animal Crossing. I realize this is a very Nintendo heavy set of examples. As Animal Crossing is a game, um, well, for a long time it was described as being sort of having similarities to Seinfeld, famously the TV show about nothing. Um, it was a game that was really about the in the best possible way, the ordinary, the everyday. So it was about routine, it was about arranging furniture, it was about doing weeding, it was about remembering to turn up at a particular time to meet a giraffe, to watch a dog play a guitar in a cafe. So it felt, felt like, um, you know, it's an interesting game already. It had a, a very different kind of tempo uh, to it, as well as being uh, different in terms of the kinds of things that you got to do. Throughout the, the latest iteration of the game was released um, about the same time when, you know, large parts of the world went into lockdowns and meeting up with friends, and daily routines became completely disrupted, even impossible. And so the game ended up, because it had an online component and you could create your island and invite your friends to it, ended up being transformed into a kind of space where people were meeting up. In the same way that Zoom had sort of become a sort of change from a you know, remote collaboration tool for businesses to a place where you might have Sunday lunches or pub quizzes. And Animal Crossing started to be improvised around. It was transformed into something that was unanticipated um, by its by its designers. So we kind of we found this you know, fascinating and wanted to better understand and document all these practices, all these ways in which Animal Crossing was being used, played with, improvised around. So we initiated this project um, uh, called the Animal Crossing Diaries, which is basically kind of open call for people to respond uh, with their um, accounts of you know, the meanings, the ways in which they were you know, Animal Crossing was kind of helping them manage their mental health, for example, bring routine back together, stay in touch with existing friends and family. And so this kind of documentation approach doesn't rely on the game still existing, doesn't require us being able to play it, but rather documenting what it was, what it meant, how it was used, why it was important to people uh, across this whole range of different uh, kind of media forms from handwritten journals to videos to songs, became a really important project for us at the game, thinking about the ways in which you document play and the transformations um, of games through the practices uh, and the diverse practices of play. And that, I'm afraid, with apologies for running over. Um, uh, it's just, yeah, what I want to run through. So thank you very much for, for listening. Apologies for running, uh, running long. And uh, yeah, thank you.